Happy Hanukkah! This year, Judaism Unbound is partnering with our friends, the Torah Studio, on a new way of celebrating Hanukkah called Apocryphist, Hanukkah Unbound and Uncanonized. We believe that Hanukkah can be a time of year where we connect to many books that were not officially included in the Hebrew Bible, but which nonetheless can be meaningful for Jewish individuals, communities, and the world. Through five bonus episodes, we will be exploring some of these books in detail and asking big questions about what canon even means. Liana Wertman, founder of the Torah Studio, which is an accessible and inclusive learning space that encourages people to take ownership of our traditional Jewish texts, and a past partner with us on live streaming events exploring books from Esther to Lamentations to Ecclesiastes to Ruth, joins us for all five of these bonus conversations. Learn more and sign up for our Apocryphist email list by visiting judaismunbound.com slash apocrypha. A-P-O-C-R-Y-P-H-A. This is a special bonus edition of Judaism Unbound. Hanukkah 2022, number five, Unbound and Uncanonized. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Dan Liebenson. And I'm Lex Rofberg. And I cannot believe it. Time has flown. We are bringing you our final episode of our Hanukkah mini bonus bonus mini series that is talking about Apocrypha, exploring these books that didn't make it into the official Bible, but which we think you should read anyway, and we especially think you should read on and around Hanukkah, a time of year that directly ties to a famous book of the Apocrypha, the book of Maccabees. So we're closing out our mini series in this episode, and we're not bringing you a particular book that we're deep diving. We, we had previous episodes that we hope you'll listen to, where we looked at Megillat Antiochus, the scroll of Antiochus. We looked at Jubilees, and we looked at Judith. But this is more of a synthesis episode. Like, what was the point of all this? What did we come away with? What are we learning? And so I kind of want to ask, you know, what did we come away with? What are we learning? So Liana, like, take us into this conclusion episode. What might we apply from this exploration of Apocrypha as we mark our Hanukkah experience this year? Thinking about Apocrypha, thinking about the books specifically that we selected, what's exciting to think about is how do the stories that we tell over time, both in writing and also orally, teach us about the people that we are and the culture and the customs we want to create. That we can write books that we need written, like the scroll of Antiochus, right? Like the rabbis needed a scroll to read that's told the story of Hanukkah the way they needed it told, and they wrote it. People told the story of Judith. People wrote the story of Judith. People had their versions of the Midrash around Genesis and wrote it into its own book. We have the right as Jews to be creative with our text. I personally, and we might disagree on this, love that we still have our canon because it allows what we're saying to be all the more powerful. The Apocrypha, the Midrash that we write is more powerful because we have canonized texts that this either goes against, adds to, or even changes inherently. To be able to keep writing those, to keep rediscovering them and bring them back into our custom honors that there has never just been one way to be Jewish, even in terms of the books that we read. I'm thinking about Hanukkah. I just want to make one tie to Hanukkah here because I think that Hanukkah is like an Apocrypha holiday in two ways. One is that it's connected to a book that's part of the Apocrypha, like you said earlier, Lex. And the other is that so many people in authority, you know, people that position themselves as Jewish authorities will say, oh, Hanukkah, it's a minor holiday. And we've talked about this on the podcast before, but it's like saying, oh, Hanukkah, it's just an apocryphal holiday. It's not a real holiday. It's not in the Bible. It's not, it's it's minor. It's, you know, it's a holiday. Yeah, it's in the Talmud. It's it's like on the list, but really it's a big nothing. And all those people that are celebrating it with all kinds of fanfare, that's just assimilation and that's just modern American consumerism and whatever it might be and trying to be like Christians and wannabes and all of that. And actually, I want to turn that into a feature, not a bug. That's exciting. That means we are living in a version of biblical times. It's making me think a little bit about the Broadway musical, The Book of Mormon, where, you know, in different ways, like biblical times is now. But we are in the process of a Jewish holiday growing in its importance. And that's why I want to suggest that maybe there's a version where we can have the canon more open than we think. I've been thinking about what 
would you want to do if, for example, you looked at the Bible and you said, there aren't so many heroes that are LGBTQ plus? Would you say, oh, let me find one that maybe like Jonathan, Saul's son, or David that had it right and say, well, I'm going to find that in the text. I'm going to identify various people as LGBTQ plus. You could do that. And people have done that. But I've been more and more intrigued by the idea that you would just write a new story and it would take place in some period in the biblical period. And it would be like adjacent to other stories, maybe like Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead, you know, where the background characters become the foreground characters. And so the other stories are happening in the background, but it's a real LGBTQ story. And you would just write it in biblical times and you would just publish it and you'd be like, that's a new book. And I just wonder why we almost think that that's absurd to do something like that in our time. Like everybody would know that it's not really from those times. And yeah, but throughout hundreds and hundreds of years, and like Lex, I think you said, they didn't have this sense that like you can't do that because we know the books that were already written in the past. And it just makes me wonder what it would look like to have that going on today. Really into both projects of finding all the queer characters in the Bible and making new stories. And also not just a long axis of LGBTQ, like finding, I mean, to quote B'nai Lapi, like finding donkey stories. If you were a donkey and you read Torah, you'd notice all the donkeys. I think that all of us should find the stories that are versions of us in the Bible and we just didn't know it yet. I do this with interfaith stuff all the time. The Bible by no means like thought it was writing stories about Jews in interfaith relationships for all sorts of reasons. But you can find them when you look for them. But is that sufficient? No. I want there to be sacred Jewish literature that centers interfaith narratives. By the way, we've talked really passingly about like Rugrats Hanukkah in this series. Like Rugrats Hanukkah is one of those. Like it's a modern day take on Hanukkah where an interfaith family is centered and it's not it's not even it's not commented on so much. It's not the point of the story, but it plays a role and it empowers people who are themselves in interfaith relationships. So we should do both of those. Um, I want to bring two of my patented word plays. One ties, Dan, to what you said about, ugh, people say it's a minor holiday. Hanukkah should be a minor holiday, spelled M-I-N-E-R, which is to say a holiday that is marked by mining for gems from Jewish tradition. We have in Jewish tradition all sorts of gems. Some of them have been placed into pretty museum cases that we go and look at regularly on specific holidays for specific rituals. Those are the canonized things, the ritualized things. They have a time of year where they're a gem that we take out and polish and pass around to the group. There's other gems that are buried way beneath the ground that are never unearthed. And by the way, like, don't connect this to climate change. Like, I'm not saying, like, we have a lot of problems with extracting things from the earth. But like, the metaphor. Um, This should be a minor holiday. This should be where we're devoted specifically to mining things that are not canonized. Because Maccabees is not canonized. Early in our podcast, Paul Golan called himself a Book of Maccabees Jew. There were there were certain kinds of Jews that are Genesis Jews, certain Exodus. He called himself Maccabees Jew because he's not even sure if he really counts by certain measures. And that to me is perfect. Let's have Hanukkah be a minor holiday in the sense that we're mining for the gems that haven't been centered in the Jewish past and bringing them into the Jewish present and future. Second word play is we've used this word canon a bunch of times. And this is a word play I've said on the past on the podcast. So this is a rerun. But the canon, C-A-N-O-N, also could be heard as canon, C-A-N-N-O-N. Like shots fired. When you make choices about books being authorized, people being authorized, people not being authorized, those are not trivial run-of-the-mill decisions. They have a big impact on the various communities and civilizations we are part of. And so we should recognize, you know, whether we totally deconstruct the canon and have no canon. I'm actually not, I, I agree with you, Liana. I, I wouldn't do that. But whether we deconstruct it entirely or we craft new canons, like those are serious acts that have a, that have a massive impact on whether people feel recognized, seen, empowered or not. And we should take real care to ensure that whatever canons we have 
are doing justice to the people that could be observing them religiously, relating to them religiously. I think one of the things that connecting what you were just saying to what Dan was saying about the other option is to just write a new book is to ask ourselves, what does it mean to write Apocrypha now, right? What would it mean to write these books at all? Do we want in one hand to do what you're saying, which is write things that are relevant to us, maybe a little bit into our history, or do we want to connect it into our canon, right? Do we want to use our canon as a jumping off point? Dan, I was just like, oh, what if I just say I happen to find this 2000 year old book of Jonathan and he's canonically gay now? Like you could write that story. Jonathan is just a sparse character. There's so much space in Torah to add him in as a whole other book that we just find all of a sudden. It's a very classic. Yeah, I'm ready for you as Joseph Smith. Like I'm ready for you to, yeah, to pull I, that I off. I found the book. It's, uh, it was I had to translate it. No one else can actually see it. I mean, look, that's what some people think Deuteronomy was, is a book that we write that means something to us now and we find it. And I think there's room for both of them, but I think we do have a richer history of people doing that to Jewish canon that um, I was thinking about in the book of Esther. I was saying earlier outside of the podcast, like I normally would think if if you were going to put the book of Esther and the book of Judith in front of me, Uh, I might edit out some of the geographical inconsistencies of the book of Judith, but I probably would pick just on content alone, the book of Judith to be canonized over the book of Esther, because it just says nothing about God in it, which is jarring to everyone to the point where in the Septuagint, the Greek version of the, of the Torah of our, of our biblical canon, they add in like four extra chapters that are only and explicitly about God. There's tr- there's a whole chapter, which is Mordecai praying to God to help Esther and the Israelites because he wouldn't bow down to Haman. There's a whole chapter about Esther praying to God before she goes in front of Ahasuerus to beg for the Israelite life. The places that we would have thought God should be, they decided to add it back in. And the way they wrote it, it was just canon, right? They just wrote them in and published the book that way. And other Israel and other Jews later looked back and went, okay, that wasn't original. We have the, the Hebrew versions, not the Greek, and we don't want to include that. But I think we we have to ask ourselves, right? Do, how do we want to position ourselves and kind of pin ourselves into our tradition? And as we're coming to times where, Thing, so much time has passed since our canon. I think there are new spaces and time periods that we can pin new stories into that allow us to, in the traditions of the rabbis, root ourselves in history, but not have to go all the way back to the canon. I've been playing around with this image lately of the unbroken chain of tradition and just thinking about how do you construct an unbroken chain One way to do it is to just add links to the chain. I think that's what we typically think of as the way to do it. But another way to do it is to have a completely new chain. Just imagine two chains lying apart from each other and then build a bunch of links that connect them. And then you have an unbroken chain after that. And there's a piece of what I'm trying to get at here that says that actually the latter, as weird as it sounds, is actually the chain of our tradition. It's the way that the collection of things that we call Judaism at any point in time did actually come about. And whether those new compositions were a new book that somebody wrote and ascribed to a person who was long dead, right? What's called pseudo epigrapha, or uh, somebody wrote a book that was purporting to be from a long time ago, or people wrote Midrash that they still kind of claimed were older and that they had received orally for a long time. Or somebody like Anita Diamond writing The Red Tent, which is, everybody agrees, a book that was written in the 21st century, I think, or maybe the 20th, I don't know, that you could imagine in a century, somebody finding and giving some greater degree of sanctity to. Whatever ends up happening, I feel like the great genius of Jewish history has been the ability to link all that together after the fact. And so part of me is just saying, like, we should be free to explore all of these directions and we'll sort of see what ends up being linkable down the road. I think it's also worth, and I I was saying we can add in these stories, but it's also worth 
noting, like I said, I don't want to change the canon, not because I think it's perfect and every story in it is what should be in there, right? Like I was just saying, Judith could easily replace Esther, even though I love the book of Esther. But I think that we have a canon that is in itself sometimes very sparse, right? Like in Torah, there's so much space. I think we need to give ourselves permission to keep creating Apocrypha and Midrash, but like to stop calling it Apocrypha. Like give it, let it all be Jewish story, right? Let this be our oral Torah. Let this be the stuff that makes Judaism, but keep the canvas and that kind of not blank slate by any means, but this kind of long, not so meaty text that keeps coming between each generation of Jews and allows us at all points to grow from it, to make new stories from it, and to connect ourselves to the stories that other people have written as well. That Judith isn't canonized, meaning that I could write a version of Judith. I'm not writing a book of Jubilee's version. Both of them could exist really strongly. And we can call on each other and, e and each other's works the same way that we call on Torah. And that strengthens us. And reading Apocrypha allows us to do that more fully because we know what other people have been thinking about and asking about from these texts for the last 2000 years. The last thing I wanted to say, it, it might seem, it was a passing mention related to the Greek chapters of Esther that are added afterwards. But then Liana, you mentioned like, they're really connected to God, but then they're in Greek. And so later folks, they decided not to use those chapters to only use the original Hebrew chapters, which God isn't mentioned. When you back out for a second, that's fascinating. We're from a tradition that talks about Hanukkah as the holiday where the Jews who like were trying to resist assimilating to the Greeks, including Greek language. We tell this story of like, there was a Judaism that is this thing that is based in Hebrew and not Greek and, you know, devoted to God and not Greek gods. And Hanukkah is all about that separation and sort of staying proud of your Jewishness in the face of that pull towards assimilation. But then we have an example of, huh, the Hebrew canonical book, Esther, ain't no God there. Like you could read that book as, I wouldn't really use the word secular, but like for the purposes, like you could read it as entirely not about God, just a good story. God is not a character. And then the Greek thing, the thing that's in the language that is supposed to be, you know, profane and secularist and not connected to religion, that's where... All of a sudden, we get this pious prayer to God from Mordecai, from Esther. We've got all this God stuff in the language that's supposed to be bad for the Jews. So in the ironic decision of the millennium, not even of the century, the ironic decision of the millennium, people decided in order to be faithful to Jewish tradition, we really got to ditch all that God stuff that's in Greek because it's in Greek. And that like God doesn't like the stuff that's in Greek. So we got to stick with the Hebrew. It's like hilarious. And so I guess my hope as we close this series is that we can just continue to find those gems, mine for those gems, because it's not so much that these books of the Apocrypha are, are better than the original. They're not. They're, but the second you have them, they provide a reflection. It's as if they're like objects and, and like they each have a shadow and then like their shadows overlap on each other. And then you start to understand the original canon differently. So that's going to conclude our mini bonus series of episodes. We really hope that you've enjoyed it. We want to hear your hot takes, your thoughts about should we have no canon? Should we have a thousand canons? Shoot us a note. Dan at JudaismUnbound.com, Lex at JudaismUnbound.com, Studio at gmail.com. We've really enjoyed connecting with all of you over the course of this holiday. And with that, this has been Judaism Unbound. <laughs>